morning and welcome to First UMC Randleman. Today is the 30th day of August in the year of our Lord 2020. Our reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Let us hear a word from our Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of heaven, of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In his book, Faith is for Weak People, author Ray Comfort wrote this. He wrote, if you regularly stand on a soapbox and speak, you will soon learn that there is nothing new under the sun and that every question can be answered. And that's because I don't know is an acceptable answer. In fact, it may just be the only answer. You see, there are some things in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, the violence there that makes me shudder. So when someone wants to know why God sometimes sanctions violence, I have to answer, I don't know. And when someone asks why God allows suffering into the world, I have to answer, I don't know. And when someone asks why a pastor's five-year-old daughter was killed in the tornado while others in the church survived, again I have to answer, I don't know. But the fact that I don't know doesn't bother me. After all, there are many things in this life that I don't know. I don't know how GPS works, but I still use it. I don't know why my husband is passive-aggressive, but I still love him. I don't know the intricacies of my computer, but I still need it. You see, I am content to not know all the ways of God because of what I do know about God. I do know that God is loving and kind and always faithful. I do know that He cannot do evil and that He is always with me. I do know that He came to earth to save me and that He suffered greatly in doing so. I know that He adores me and that there are times He even sings over me. And so because of what I do know about God, I trust God. But what about you? What do you know about God and do you trust God? Because that church is the question that Jesus is asking us today. And so, because of what I do know about God, I trust God. But what about you? What do you know about God and do you trust God? Because that is the question Jesus is asking of us today. Who do you say that I am? And what do you know about me? So let's pause here for just a minute. Because in this passage I just read that Jesus took his disciples north out of Galilee to a beautiful grotto at the foot of Mount Hermon in the ancient district of Caesarea Philippi. Now it was a place where the gods of Rome were worshipped and where a huge marble bust of Caesar could be seen from every direction and where the god of Pan was thought to exist. It was a playground for the wealthy, a place where gambling was common and where violence was an everyday occurrence. 
And so it was here uh, with the gods of the world surrounding them that Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? You see, church, according to Matthew, we are now just a few chapters away from the road to Golgotha, the Via Della Rosa. So Jesus is running out of time. He has spent the past three years with these 12 men teaching them daily who he is and what he is about to do. And now he wants to know what they know. Do they get it? Or do they see him as just another prophet? Do the disciples have any idea yet who he really is? And so Peter, great, good old buddy Peter, spokesperson for all the disciples, steps forward and says, You are the Messiah, Son of the living God. And now while it is clear that Peter does not fully understand just yet what that means, all that means, he's still absolutely right. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. So there is no one like him. He is the Son of of the living God. So yes, Peter is right. And because he is right, Jesus blesses him and makes a prophetic pronouncement over him. And get this church, Jesus still blesses those who come to recognize that he is the Christ. And because of all the mayhem and the chaos and the storms going on in our world, and because of all the suffering and all the heartbreak, and because of all the hurt in our own lives, we need this reminder. We need to understand that Jesus still blesses those who come to know who He is. So I want to pause here again. Because I think that right now you need a clear understanding of the difference between Jesus and the other so-called gods in the world. So to begin with, I think you need to realize that all of the major religions agree on two things. First, they agree that the human race once had a very close relationship with God. And second, they agree that the human race lost that close relationship with God. However, where the religions disagree is on how the relationship with God can be restored. In fact, this is where these religions divide into two categories, active and reactive. An active religion teaches that a person must do something to restore his or her relationship with God. For example, Judaism warns that we must obey the law and all of it. And Hinduism tells us to meditate, to diet, and to squelch our passions. Islam bids us to give alms to the poor, pray five times a day while facing Mecca, and fight Allah's holy wars. These religions say, do something. Take the initiative. Reach out to God. Find God. Prove to God that you are worthy. But reactive religion is the kind that says, there is nothing whatsoever that I can do to restore my relationship with God. I blew it, and therefore only God is capable of fixing it and of fixing me. And church, Christianity is its only representative. You see, through Jesus Christ, God has acted decisively and capably once and for all to reach out to us human beings. And so our responsibility is to be reactive, which means that we are to repent and to believe what God has done through Jesus Christ. So I want you to look at it this way. Confucius and Muhammad and Buddha are merely the initiatives of men, but Jesus is the initiative of God. He is compassionate and merciful. His character is sterling. He performed and is still performing extraordinary miracles. And His unfathomable love 
is extraordinary for us. And remember this, his life and ministry were predicted eons ago. And that's because God wasn't messing around with his chosen people. God pointed over and over to Jesus, telling the world that help and salvation through Jesus was on the way. In fact, the prophecies were quite specific about it. Listen to some of the things they said. They said that the Savior sent from God would have a virgin birth and no poverty that he would be born in Bethlehem, be called a Nazarene, and yet God would call him out of Egypt. He would come from the tribe of Judah, the house of David. His ministry would be a ministry of miracles, and yet he would be rejected by his own people. He would suffer as a servant, die like a sacrificial lamb, and not one of his bones would be broken. In church, there are over 300 such prophecies. And Jesus fulfilled them all. You see, these are the things that through the Word of God we know about Jesus. And we know these things because God cares about the well-being of the whole person. After all, if I became a Muslim, my religion promises to make me right with Allah. But it offers no relationship with myself, with others, or with any of God's created order. And if I became a pantheist, I get right with nature, but I ignore my relationship with God and other people. And if I became a Hindu through diet and through meditation, I achieve this relationship with myself, but have nothing whatsoever to do with God, with others, or creation. But in Christ, I am promised a relationship that is based on a love that intellectually, emotionally, and willfully includes God, self, neighbor, and all of creation. So I want to rest here again. Because although words look like they're just marks on a paper or sounds that fill the air, there are some words that have the power to control us. One little word or one string of little words can make us laugh or they can make us cry. They can make us love or they can make us despise, fight or flee. In fact, some words can literally change our moods and even our minds. And church, I am convinced that the most powerful word or name ever uttered or put to pen is the name of God. And so when our thinking about God is correct and consistent and focused, then we think correctly about everything else in life. So I also think that more than anything else, we really need to get this. We need to know who God is. I mean, looking back over my life, I can see where I have been mistaken about almost everything at one time or another. I've been wrong about whether someone is trustworthy or simply a scoundrel, whether to believe a telemarketer or a politician, and whether or not I should have bought that dress without having tried it on. Yet when I think back on my most costly mistakes, I realize they rested squarely on my misconceptions of God. You see, sometimes the God of my own making was a cruel, cruel taskmaster, subjecting me to all sorts of demands. And then other times he was like a milk toast deity that put me in time out whenever I acted up. But that is not who God is. First and foremost, God is love. And we like that definition. I know I like that definition. That's a, a great and wonderful and perfect attribute of God. In fact, we're okay when God is described like that. That is a comforting thing to say and to remind ourselves about that God is love. Why, we even are willing to highlight God's loving attributes and promises in yellow and orange and red in our Bibles. We write notes beside them and we write the dates down that when God gave us His oh-so-wonderful promises. Yet love is still not all there is to God. 
We don't highlight the attributes about God that scare us, now do we? Or the promises that convict us? I mean, how many of you have Deuteronomy 4.24 where we are told that our God is a consuming fire highlighted in your Bibles? Or how about John 16.33 where it warns, In the world you will have tribulation. Or Matthew 16.10 where we are told that Jesus himself says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of of wolves. We don't highlight those things because we don't want to hear those things from the mouth of God about God. Do we? In fact, we may as well admit it that we take from the Word of God only what pleases us. So I want to pause here again because in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, 12, and 13, this is one passage that we cannot disregard ever. And this is what it says. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thought and intents, intentions, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And church, I want you to understand that that word open comes from the Greek word trachelizo. And we get our word trachea or throat from that word. And it means literally to lay bare. In fact, the idea goes way back to the Old Testament sacrificial days. And there we are told that when a priest made a sacrifice, he would pull back the lamb's neck, stretch it, and then run a blade across the jugular. And I tell you this because God's word often goes to the jugular. That is why some servants' sermons comfort the afflicted and some afflict the comfortable. We have to learn to allow God to tell us who He is and to speak the truth over our lives or we are never going to fully know ourselves or God. In Exodus 3, we read that when Moses met God at the burning bush, he asked Him one thing. He asked, what is your name? And church, that is the greatest question of all things, and it is in the heart of every human being. What is the name of God? In fact, the fate of every one of us hangs on the answer because every one of us who say that we are in Christ must, must answer that question for ourselves. What is God's name? What is God's characters? What is God's like? What does it mean to be in Christ? Who do you say that I am? So God answered Moses' question this way. He said, I am. This is my name forever. And church, that answer, I am, expresses eternity and expresses the one who exists without being subject to change. In fact, it is the very first trait necessary in a God that we can depend on. For we cannot depend on a God who changes so when God says, I am, He is saying, I will be whatever you need to me to be as you carry out my directives. So you see, as we obediently follow God's um, assignments, then we, and we face a need, we, we then learn something new about our God. In fact, this unfinished name allows us to add to it without any limitations whatsoever. So who do you say I am? And Peter was the first person to get it, to really get who Jesus is. He was the first person to make that leap of faith and see in Jesus the Son of the living God, the great I am. 
And because he knew who Jesus was, and because he said it out loud, Peter became the first member of the church. And that's why Jesus called him the rock. You see, the entire church was built on Peter's statement of faith, You are, I am. So Jesus said to Peter, Blessed are you, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So I want to pause here one last time. Because years ago there was a story in the New York Times about a little group girl who grew up in the early 20th century when um, work crews would mark their construction sites by putting out smudge pots with these open flames. And, and sadly, the little girl got too close to one of those pots and it caught her pants on fire. And although she survived, she lived the rest of her life with scars running the length of her legs that looked like little pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So one day when she was in the third grade, she was asked, if you could have one wish, what would it be? And this is what she said. She said, I want everyone to have legs like mine. When we suffer pain, we want others to understand. When we are hurt or damaged, we want others to be like us so they can identify with us. And we don't ever want to be alone. And God knew that. And so because God knew that, He sent us Jesus Christ, fully human and fully divine, so that we can know that He, God, knows. By entering into the experience of the cross, our God took the man-made wreckage of this world inside of Himself and He labored over it for three days. And He did not let it go until He could transform it and return it to us as life. You see, the power of a suffering God is not to prevent pain, but to redeem it by going through it with us. The Bible tells us that the, Jesus is the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. It tells us that He turned water into wine, and that He healed the lame, the blind, and the deaf, that He calmed a storm, that He multiplied food in order to feed thousands, that He raised the dead, died for our sins, and that He was resurrected forever defeating sin and death. That's what we're told in the Word of God. Moses and Muhammad they're dead, but not Jesus. You and I, we serve a living God. And because each one of us is part of the church, part of the body of Christ, we have to know who He is and what that means. So I'm going to tell you one more time what I know. Because I know that Jesus was sent by God. I know that Jesus is our salvation as an expression of the love of God. I know that Jesus is alive right now, having defeated death for all of us. I know that had I been the only one, He would have still gone to the cross. And I know that my sins put Him there. I know that He's forgiven me and that He stands before God today on my behalf. And I know that He has given me His Holy Spirit to lead me through this life. I know that He never committed a sin and that He loves me beyond measure and that this is His church under which we are all one body. And I know that one day I will touch the hand of Jesus the Christ, the living Son of God, my Lord and my Savior, and I will spend the rest of eternity with Him. This is what I know about God because I love God. But what about you? What do you know about God? Who is it that you say He is? Because it's a question that only you can answer. So be it. Amen. There was no law given to the Israelites until after God's people had first experienced God's love, God's mercy, and God's power. And yet they still didn't understand who He was, who He really was. 
And they didn't learn that until God sent Jesus. And church, if you ask me, it's easy to make a memorial of your life for someone who's left his throne in glory and taken the form of a servant and became obedient even unto death so that at the cross, your debt and my debt could be marked paid in full. It's easy to give a memorial for someone who's laid down his life for you, isn't it? It's easy to take off your shoes before God like that. We can hear our names being called by a God like that. In fact, we can say, Here I am, send me to a God like that. So remember that God's number one identifying factor is that He is love. And again, that's not there is all there is to Him. Yet if we love Him back, then we will in turn obey Him no matter the cost. For I also know that whatever He requires us to walk through, He's big enough to get us through. So receive now this blessing. May the God of manna in the desert, well springs in the wilderness, honey from the rock, wine from water. May this God provide what you most need for the work God most desires. So be it. Amen.